Pentecost was a celebration that took place 50 days following Passover. It had been celebrated for hundreds and hundreds of years with people traveling to Jerusalem from all over the world to observe this celebration. But that Pentecost Sunday that took place immediately following the ascension of Jesus was unlike any other. It was very remarkable because it was the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the followers of Jesus in such a distinct way that from that time forward, people refer to this as the Pentecost experience or even call themselves Pentecostal Christians. We are rejoining a series today that we started a couple of summers ago called We Are Pentecostal. We're looking at the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives today, how he empowers us and and how he helps us us to bring out the Christ-like qualities in our life, and really how the Holy Spirit helps us to stay on mission. You remember the mission that Jesus gave to all of his followers just before he ascended back into heaven. He said, now you go everywhere around the world and tell people about me and about this good news of what I did for them on the cross. We come to the the outpouring of the Holy Spirit here in Acts chapter 2, and it was a amazing event. Remember that there's people from all over the world that are visiting Jerusalem. When this outpouring first takes place, this baptism in the Holy Spirit, there's a bunch of mockers, some skeptics that say, it sounds like a bunch of drunk people babbling over there. But the people that were visiting from around the world said, no, it's not babbling. I hear in my own native language, I hear people over there declaring the wonders of God. Whether you were a worshiper or whether you were a skeptic, Luke records for us in Acts chapter 2 that everyone was amazed and perplexed. And so Peter stands up to preach a sermon to really prepare people and, and help them understand what had just been launched right here and what was going to happen from this point forward. Let's look at it in Acts chapter 2. It says, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then starting in verse number 17, he quotes from Joel. In those last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, let me ask you a question. When Peter stands up to preach here, why does he go to these words that were written by the prophet Joel? Well, let me ask another question. What did people in Peter's day call the 39 books of the Bible that now you and I refer to as the Old Testament, the books from Genesis through Malachi? What did they call those books? They didn't call it the Old Testament. They called it Scripture. They understood that it was God's Word speaking to them. So what we have in the New Testament now what we call the New Testament, is essentially a commentary on the Old Testament scripture. It is people like Peter and Paul and James and Jude that are writing down under the same inspiration of the Holy Spirit that inspired Joel, for instance, to write those words. Peter says, now I see more clearly what Joel was talking about. Joel was writing these words down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit before the advent of Jesus, before his death and burial and resurrection, before this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He saw that coming, he foretold it, and he wrote it down for us. And now we're on the other side of these things. We've seen Jesus fulfill these prophecies, and now we've even seen the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so now we can comment on that and say, yes, it was foretold, and now it has been fulfilled. So in essence, what we have in the 27 books of the New Testament is a commentary on the first 39 books of 
the Bible, the Old Testament. We need both parts. Both parts shine light on each other. We would be missing it if we said, well, we live in the New Testament era now. We don't need that Old Testament anymore. Those two books fit together. And so Peter quotes Joel. Now, I want you to think about something here. Now, I have my Bible right here, and it's, um, you know, it's pretty convenient size for me to be able to carry around. You can even have it in your phone, and it's even easier to access those books of the Bible. Peter, in his day, didn't have a convenient book to carry around with him. The Old Testament scriptures were written down on parchments, on scrolls. But this will tell you how immersed that Peter was in scripture and, and, and how familiar he was with it because the Holy Spirit prompts him here to quote Joel and, and he didn't pull out a scroll and open up and read it. He just started. So there are three things that I see that are different between the passage that's quoted from Joel chapter two and what Peter quotes here. And two of them, I think, are quite interesting let me point them out to you. The first one is this. Joel, in his opening words, in Joel chapter 2, verse 28, he says, And afterward I will pour out my spirit. Notice how Peter starts off. He says, In the last days I will pour out my spirit. I think that that's very noteworthy. And I'm going to just put a pin in that for a second. We'll come back to that in just a moment. The other thing that I see, the second thing, is at the end of verse number 18, Peter adds a phrase here. He says, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. That phrase, and they will prophesy, is not there in Joel chapter 2. But clearly, it, the idea of prophesying shows up in both Joel chapter 2 and what Peter starts quoting earlier on, where it says that your sons and daughters will prophesy. Now, the word prophesy um, a lot of times when you think of a prophet or you think of a prophecy being given, you think of somebody telling you what's coming in the future, foretelling what's coming in the future. Now, that certainly can be the case, but prophecy is not just foretelling, it's also forth telling. It's, it's telling you what is going to come, but it's also forth telling. It is saying, this is what God's word says. And so in essence, in, in this case, we can say that the prophet Joel was foretelling what was going to come with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then Peter is now forth telling. He is saying, yes, this is exactly the fulfillment. And so the phrase, phrase that he adds there, and they will prophesy, I think is really just an emphasis because remember, there's some people that are saying, are they drunk? And Peter starts off at the beginning. They're, they're not drunk, like, like you're saying. They're prophesying. And I think he inserts that phrase again, just as a reminder, this is prophecy. You heard them declaring the wonders of God. They were forth telling how wonderful God is. And that's prophecy. The third difference that I see is right at the end of their remarks, Joel says it this way. He talks about the day, the coming day of the Lord as the dr great and dreadful day of the Lord. And Peter describes it this way. He says the great and glorious day of the Lord. A dreadful day or a glorious day? Which is it? Well, the Hebrew word that's used by Joel for dreadful means um, a day that is to be reverenced. It's a heavy day. It, it is a final day. It is a day for supreme dread for those people who are about to be pronounced guilty by the coming of the Lord, by the ultimate judge. And it is a day of supreme rejoicing for those who are about to be declared innocent by the judge. But it is a dreadful day because it's not a day that somebody could say, oh, I still have got a chance to go back and do something different, to make a change. It is final. It is over. It's done. You can't make any changes at that time. There's no redos at that time. The word that Peter uses here for glorious in the Greek New Testament, it's the only time that this word shows up. Now, I'm going to tell you that the, the Greek word, um, it's epiphany. But you understand that we, we kind of have transliterated that really into the English language. That idea of epiphany means that the light comes on, that you finally see something. It's been murky. It's been dark. It's been confusing. You've been puzzling over it, wondering over it. And all of a sudden you go, oh, I see this. Okay, And that's why I say that the, that 
New Testament is sort of that commentary. We saw the prophecies coming. We, we read about those in the scripture. It, they were foretold. And now we've seen it on the other side of the advent of Jesus. And we have this epiphany. This light has come on. We say, oh, this finally makes sense. Interestingly, when the Septuagint is written. Now, the Septuagint is when these scholars take the Hebrew Old Testament and write it into the Greek language. They use that same word for epiphany back there in Joel chapter 2, so that it does say the great and glorious day. You could really say it the same way. I really think of it this way, though. For those on the other side of Calvary, it was a dreadful day because the judgment was coming. But on pe for people after Jesus had paid the penalty for our sins and we could put our faith in him for forgiveness, the coming of the day of the Lord is now a glorious day to look forward to. And so I think that's the reason between those two ideas of disastrous day, this heavy day, or this glorious day that is going to be a day of celebration. Now, I told you of, the, of those three differences. That first one is right at the beginning uh, where Joel says, and afterwards, and Peter says, in the last days. Um, and I told you we want to come back to that one. Now, in a sense, what Peter's talking about here is they really have stepped into the last days. It's after something. It was after the advent of Jesus. It was after his death and resurrection. And so Peter, I think, recognizes now, hey, just like Jesus was foretold to come and to pay the penalty for our sins, it's also been foretold that he's coming back again as the judge, as the, that final judge. There is that day of the Lord coming. And so he recognized we are in these last days because it is taking place after this first advent of Jesus. But let's go back to Joel when he says, and afterward. That implies that something came before that. What came before that? Well, in the beginning of Joel chapter 2, we're reading about an invasion of locusts. And, and this is not metaphorical. It's not a picture. Uh, it really is locusts. There are locusts that are coming in. And in an agrarian culture like this, the, the a locust coming in or, or something like a drought or a fire or something like that could absolutely wipe out that whole society. And so here comes these locusts. And so look at what Joel's response is. It's, it's, it's a response of warning. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. Now he says there's actual locusts crawling across the ground here. This is disastrous for us. But it's also a warning that there is something more final that's coming. The locusts could come through and eat everything, and we could grow these crops again. But there's something else that's coming. And so then he makes this change. The, the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. It is a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and darkness, or blackness, like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was of old, nor ever will be in ages to come. Before them, before they even get there, a fire devours. Behind them, a flame blazes. Before them, the land is like the Garden of Eden, but behind them, it's a desert waste nothing escapes them. You can see the absolute disaster, the absolute devastation that's coming. And then he makes this transition to say, understand then about the day of the Lord. Before them, the earth shakes, the sky trembles, the sun and moon are darkened, and the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number, and mighty are those who obey his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? So he said, hey, folks, you look out here and you see these locusts coming and you see them just devouring everything in their path as they move along, that's nothing compared to how dreadful the day of the Lord is going to be if you are a sinner. And so his response is this, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart 
and not your garments. No, a sign of mourning for some people was to grab their clothes and just rip them and then to put dust on their head, to, to wear rough clothes like just a sackcloth, to just put that on and wear that as your clothing. What God says here is, I, I don't want so much the outward show. I want your hearts to be changed here. So he said, so rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. So when you look on the horizon and you see that disaster coming, it's a heart issue, not an external issue. Don't rip apart your clothes unless your heart has been broken before God first. That's what God is looking at is the attitude of the heart. And so then Joel goes on to say again, now blow another trumpet, not a trumpet of alarm, but blow a trumpet that is calling everybody to a sacred assembly, that's calling them to a time of prayer and fasting because we want the Lord to relent from this calamity. We want him to save us from this disaster. And then God speaks and says, now that I've seen your heart, I've seen your heart change. I'm not going to bring that disaster on you. And so then Joel says, and afterward, after we have already repented and our hearts have been broken, after we're in that place, then God's going to pour out his spirit on us. Why is he going to do that? Well, look at that last word that Joel uses. And it's also the last word that Peter uses when he quotes Joel is this. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, he's wanting godly people to have their heart broken for the godlessness around them. He's wanting godly people to feel the weight of these godless people that are going to be in an eternity separated from God. And because of that, then they begin to fast and to weep and to mourn, to rend their hearts and not their garments. And God says, when I see that, when I see you in that state, then I'm going to pour out my spirit on you so that you are going to be empowered to tell people the good news so that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the reason for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But did you notice in, in these words here, these the darkness that's coming. He, he, he says that, you know, the sun and the moon aren't going to shine anymore. The stars aren't going to give their light. It's going to be a day of darkness and gloom. It's going to be a day of disaster has been the word that I've been using. You know, that word disaster comes from a Latin word originally that's dis astros, dis astros. That word astros means stars. It's where we get the idea of the uh, um, the astronomy, the, the lights in the heaven, and that dis means that it's missing. That's what a disaster is, is really a hopeless darkness. We, we don't have a light to guide us out of this. Well, you know what? There's a light that's going to come into the world. It was prophesied first by Isaiah when he said this, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And then John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, Luke records for us that the Holy Spirit moves on him and he begins to prophesy just before the birth of Jesus. And listen to these words that are really this fulfillment of the Isaiah 9 prophecy. Zechariah says this, because of the tender mercy of our God, which by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. That word that he uses for shine is the root word of the word that, that Peter uses when he says the glorious day of the Lord. It's epiphaneo. It's that same word for epiphany. The light is going to shine where? In that place of disaster, in that place of hopeless darkness, the light is coming. Now, we can't generate that light ourselves. As followers of Jesus, as committed as we are to Jesus, as in love with him as we are, we can't generate the light ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit to do that for us. That's the promise that Jesus gave us. Look what he said in the book, uh, in John chapter 16. 
But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, that's the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And so then he says to his followers, so do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised which you have heard me speak about, and that's those words in John chapter 16 that he just spoke about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So in Joel's understanding, when people turned their heart towards God after they did that, then the Holy Spirit was poured out so that they could go and tell everyone to be able to call on the name of the Lord. And the same thing is happening with Peter. He uses in the last days, but it's really afterward, after this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is now signifying for us that we are in the last days. This outpouring of the Holy Spirit is so that, and he concludes with those same words, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. Now make no mistake about it, in Peter's day, It was a day of almost as much darkness as what Joel talked about with these locusts coming and destroying everything. Their economy was being destroyed. Their way of life was being destroyed. In AD 6, the Roman emperor issued an edict that took away capital punishment from the Jewish people, Took took it away from this religious body and gave it to this civic body. Now, for the Jews, they said, no, wait a minute. When when we read the Torah, when we read God's law, there is a death penalty that goes along with violating some of these laws that are here. And if you take away our ability to enforce the law in that way, if you take away our ability to really use the fear of that punishment, you have undercut our whole religion. We, 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 what are we going to rely on? How, how are we going to, to uh, hold people to this law? In their mind, and when that edict came down in AD 6, their whole religious uh, purpose was, and their religious underpinning was collapsing. It was a day of darkness. They thought, we, we've missed it. We, 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 we thought the Messiah was coming. We thought the Messiah would come before ever anything happened like this. Our, our whole way of belief, our whole system is collapsing. It's all falling in. It was disastrous, disastros. It was a time of complete darkness. It was a time of hopeless darkness. But then Jesus came. You remember the words that he said? I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus came to bring that light. And he is the light of the world. But you know what Jesus also said to you and me? These words, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. I am the light of the world. But we can't light that light ourselves. This is where we need this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In a world of disaster, in a world of hopeless darkness, we need to be the light bearers. And so the Holy Spirit is poured out into our lives for that very purpose. The Holy Spirit's empowerment ignites us and aligns us so that our light bearing can be seen in this disaster prone, hopeless darkness world. That's why the Holy Spirit empowers us so that everyone can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. We can't do that on our own. Now, what did Joel say the response was when we see the darkness coming? He says, blow the trumpet, call a sacred assembly, fast, rend your hearts. Let there be a heart breaking over the hopeless darkness around you. Let there be a calling out to God for his empowerment of the spirit in our lives so that we can bring light to this dark place. People have always relied on religious observances, the the outward practices to try to make them seem right in God's sight. 
there was a day of fasting that was called for. And I want to take you back to Isaiah chapter 58, where God addresses the kind of fasting that he's looking for. Not the kind where we're ripping our clothes, rending our garments, but a kind that starts in the heart and then works its way out. Isaiah 58 says this, shout it aloud, do not hold it back, raise your voice like a trumpet. We've heard that trumpet call in Joel. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day, they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. Now, listen, friends, let's, this is ancient Israel, but could we say the same thing about our country today? A country that seems like they're doing what's right. It seems like they want to have a relationship with God. I mean, it's printed on our money and God we trust. We place our hand over our heart and say the Pledge of Allegiance, and we say one nation under God. We have our presidents that will conclude their speeches by saying, and may God bless America. But are we seeking God? And that's what he said here. They seem eager to know my ways. They seem like they're seeking me. They ask me for just decisions. They seem eager for God to come near them. And then the people respond, So why have we fasted, they say, and you, God, have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you've not noticed? And God says, because you're just doing it outwardly. Yet on the day of your fasting, God says, you do not, you do not, uh, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Let me read that again. You cannot fast as you do today. You cannot just keep on doing religious practices as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. And then he says, this is the kind of fast I'm looking for. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Only for a day, a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and laying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? God says, no, this is what I want. Is that this the kind of fast that I've chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Now he tells us three things. If that's the if you fast this way, then he gives us three then statements. If you fast this way, then here's what's going to happen. Or to use his word before, you cannot fast as you've been doing. You can't do the religious practices and accept your, expect your voice to be heard on high. But if you fast the way that I tell you, then you can expect these three things. One, then your light, your light in a disaster prone world, in a dark world, your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. That's the fast that God is looking for. That's what he wants us to do. That's how he wants us to call on him, is, is this breaking of, of our hearts. He wants it to be a heart posture that's different. When we see the darkness, when we see the disaster in the world, when we see people walking around in hopeless darkness, we say, I want to shine a light. I can't do it on my own. I feel for them. I feel the darkness that they have. And I want to shine a bright light. I want to shine your light to point people so that everyone may call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Peter, in his second letter, the same Peter that delivered this sermon in Acts chapter 2, in his second letter, listen to what he says. First of all, you must understand that in last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires, and they will say, where is this coming that God promised? Where is this last day this day of the Lord, this day of judgment. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But Peter says, but they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. Noah's Ark. This is just a little foretaste of the judgment coming. Um, 
By the same word, the present heaven and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Listen, if you look back, uh, let me forth tell this. Look back what God has promised and already done. Now, if he's done that, then what he's promised that's still yet to come is going to come. Listen to how Peter goes on. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Sounds just like what Joel said and what Peter quoted. We want everyone to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. And so then Peter asked this question, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. You ought to be the light bearers in a disaster prone world, a world that's where people are stumbling around in hopeless darkness. Listen, friends, today, there is as much, if not more, darkness and hopelessness than there were in the days of Joel, that there were in the days of Peter. We are closer now to the day of the Lord, the final judgment, than we've ever been before. That should break your heart for a world that would approach that day as a day that is dreadful. We want people to approach it as a day that is the glorious day of the Lord, but they have to be able to call on the Lord and be saved. And they can't do that if they're walking around in hopeless darkness. They need to see the light. So friends, I'm calling us to a time of fasting. I'm calling us to a time of turning our hearts in eager anticipation to what God wants to do because it's after that that he will reignite, that he will pour out his spirit so that we can prophesy, so that we can be the epiphany, that we can be the light in a dark world. Now, friends, listen, literally, the word for fast in the Hebrew means to cover the mouth. It, nothing goes in. So we fasting can be don't put any food in your mouth. But you know what? God looks more at what's in your heart than he does what is or isn't on your plate. It could be that covering the mouth means words coming out as well. So here's the time of fasting I'm calling us to. I'm calling us to a time of fasting at midday on Fridays. I don't know what that would look like for you. I, I don't know how God would lay that on your heart. It could be that he might say, cover your mouth. Don't eat any food from the time you break your fast Friday morning until later in the afternoon or the evening on Friday and use that time to seek my face. It might be that he says, cover your mouth and don't talk to other people during that time. Don't get on social media and be posting things where you're broadcasting things, but be in the receive mode. Be before God quietly with your Bible open and maybe a notebook nearby and just say, God, what is it that you want to speak to me? What do I need to change in my life? What do I need to have realigned so that I can be a better light bearer in this disaster prone world? I don't know how God's going to speak to you. But friends, I do know what... Uh, God said to us in Isaiah that when we do fast that way, then your light will break forth. Then your righteousness will be seen. Then you will call and the Lord will say, here I am. He'll answer us. Maybe you have a wayward family member that's walking around in darkness and you want them to see the light. Fast for them. Pray for them. Pray that God will use your light. Pray that God will use the light of other light bearers, of other spirit-empowered Christians to be able to shine a light on that loved one. Maybe there's a strained relationship and you like, I don't know how to solve this. And as you're alone with God, as you lay this out before him, God's going to speak to your heart. Maybe it's the darkness you see in your community. Maybe it's the, the bleakness that you see in our economy or in our politics. Whatever it is, don't just do an outward ripping of your clothes. Don't just sit around and complain about it and talk about what things should be done. Cover your mouth and get alone with God. Let your heart be broken. Find ways, as, as uh, Isaiah, uh, God says through Isaiah here, to address injustice, to feed hungry people, 
to set people free. You know, that's how Peter in Acts chapter 10 summed up the ministry of Jesus. He said, Jesus went around anointed with the Holy Spirit and power, healing people and setting them free from the power of the devil. That's how you and I can be used. But we can't do that in our own strength. We have to fast before God. We have to get alone in his presence. And afterwards, God's going to pour out his spirit. He's going to empower us. He's going to bring the light out of us so that we can be an epiphany to a world that is walking around in darkness, a world that is on the edge of disaster, the ultimate disaster of being separated from God forever and ever. Friends, I'm calling you to a time of fasting, Fridays at midday. If you want to share with me in the comments maybe how God lays on your heart to fast, that would be great. It would be an encouragement to me and to others. If you want to reach out to me privately uh, and talk about this more, there's a lot of ways to do that. But I'm asking you to join me for a time of fasting so that the Holy Spirit can be poured into our lives afresh and anew. We can be reignited, realigned to be light bearers in a darkness, disaster-prone world. God bless you, friends.